Greetings, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about combination bias, feedback bias, collector feedback bias, emitter feedback bias. These are alternate ways of biasing our transistors. They offer somewhat simplified circuitry and some beta stability, some cue point stability with beta, um, although perhaps not as, as effective as the uh, two supply emitter bias and the voltage divider bias. So let's go back to our simple base bias. This is the very first circuit we looked at when we uh, looked at the common emitter configuration. Base resistor, collector resistor, and power supply. Now, the issue with this particular circuit, the reason why it's not very stable, is because the base current is very stable. So therefore, any changes in beta are directly reflected in changes of collector current. Remember, IC is equal to beta IB. So here, your base current is defined by your power supply and the base resistor, because it's the power supply minus the uh, base emitter potential. That's what drops on RB. And just using Ohm's law, that voltage divided by RB gives you the base current multiplied by beta, which is going to change. And there's your collector current. A minor change to this can improve the stability, and that's simply picking up the base resistor and moving its connection point. So we're going to be using something called negative feedback. And you use uh, negative feedback all the time in real life. Basically, it's a way of monitoring what you're doing. And if something is going awry, you sort of move things in the opposite direction. We study negative feedback in considerable detail uh, later on in our coursework. So we're going to start with something called collector feedback. And all I'm going to do is take this base resistor and return it. So that the power supply, I'm going to return it to the collector. This one little change will have a major impact. Now, if we consider what's happening here, before we go into any formulas, if there is some base current being produced and there's a change in beta, maybe things heat up, the collector current would go up and what that would do is produce a bigger drop across the collector resistor, which means your collector voltage, right, from here to ground is going to go down because it's VCC minus this resistor drop that gives you this. Well, except for the VBE, that's what drops across RB. In other words, beta goes up, collector current goes up, VC goes down, which makes the voltage across RB go down, which makes the base current go down, and that tends to fight the initial change in collector current. So you'll get some change, but you won't end up with this situation where a doubling in beta will double collector current. Maybe over here, a doubling in beta might increase the collector current 20, 30, 40%, all depending on what the resistor values are, right? But it's, an, it's a no more complicated circuit than this one. So it works out pretty well. And to derive a formula, we would, as usual, we would go to KVL. So if we look at our uh, flow here right? we could do something like this there's a drop across rc a drop across rb and a drop across the base emitter and that's what's going to give us vcc right so kvl basically says vcc has to equal the drop on rc plus the drop on rb plus vbe and as usual we can write these two drops in terms of ohm's law in other words IC times RC and uh, IB times RB, where IC can be replaced with, um, uh, excuse me, IB can be replaced with IC over beta. And when we do that, and I'll pull my constants over here. In fact, if you look at this closely, you realize that the current through the uh, collector resistor is actually the emitter current because you got base current this way in the and the uh, collector current goes there. So it's IB plus IE that are actually flowing through our RC. Small variation for typical betas, but nonetheless. So you end up with this. 
right? That's IE right there. And then, like I said, you do the, the substitutions and then solve for IC. And you get VCC minus VBE divided by your RC plus RB over beta. And as usual, if you can make RB over beta a lot smaller than RC, you get high stability. Um, you're not probably going to get as good a result off this uh, as you would on like a two supply emitter bias because there are practical constraints on, on how large, how small you can make these things. All right, now, load line. Well, your cutoff voltage is going to be total power supply. Your saturation current would be all of this voltage divided by the collector resistance. All right, so this is one way of doing it. Another way is to place a resistor in the emitter. And this will have a similar effect. As the current would go up, this drives the emitter voltage up, which gives us less voltage for RB, and therefore the base current goes down. But as you can guess, there are sort of limitations on the emitter, the size of the emitter resistor. Um, in fact, you can do both. That, by the way, is called an emitter feedback, right? Collector feedback, emitter feedback. Then we can do what I like to call a combination bias or combination uh, feedback bias. Or we do both, right? Why do one when you can do both? So here's our emitter resistor, base, collector, that's a B, BCC. And we once again, we do the um, KVL here. And we can see there's four things, right? This resistor, the base, base emitter, and an additional V of RE. So when we derive the equation for this, right, VCC is going to be V of RC plus V of RB, plus VBE, plus V of RE. And if we then do the same thing, right, write these in terms of their Ohm's law equivalence, we come up with a formula for IC. I'll skip the intermediate step. And then in the, um, in the denominator, we have this extra term. This is really the most general case. You know, if you look at it, this is kind of a special case where RE goes to zero. So this disappears and you get this equation. If you did it with just RE, in other words, you left it like this with an RE, um, you would end up with this equation where RC goes to zero. Okay. Um, and then you could just, you know, solve it from that. So this is really the most general case. Um, the load line on this changes a little bit because you have the extra RE. So if you wanted to sort of piggyback on here, you could just do this. And again, if RE is zero, you just plug zero in there. Okay. And, and there you go. All right. This, if you look at it, is only one resistor less than a voltage divider. And a voltage divider is actually going to wind up to be uh, quite a bit more stable. So you know, we're kind of going down a path here where we're improving it, but, you know, if maybe we just took that one extra step, it might be even better. Well, just to show you how this works, right, just to show you how effective it is, let's do a simple collector feedback. Okay, I'm going to put a 20 volt supply on here, 1K resistor. 100K over here. I'm going to see initially beta is 100. Okay, so our collector current using our formula is going to be 20 minus the 0.7 on VBE divided by RC, that's 1K, plus the RB over beta, 100K 
divided by 100. All right, so that's going to be 19.3 volts divided by 2K. That's going to get us 9.65 mils. All right. You take the 9.65 mils and you pass that through the 1K, that'll get you 9.65 volts. So we've got 20, we've got 9.65, the remainder is VCE. So VCE must equal 10.35 volts. Okay. Now let's look at a load line for this. So the cutoff on this is going to be the power supply of 20 volts. The saturation current is our 20 volts divided by the collector resistor. We don't have it on metal resistor. So that's 20 milliamps. All right, we've got 9.65, so not quite halfway. The 10.35 volts, slightly over halfway. Now, we turn around and we say, what happens if beta is 200? So I put a different transistor in there. It's got twice the beta. And our original base bias, this current would have doubled. We would have been, you know, way up here, almost on top of uh, saturation, right? Two times this. So, you know, we'd be looking at like 19.3 milliamps, right on top of saturation. What happens here? Well, go through the formula. 20 minus 0.7. RC is 1K, RB is 100K, but now it's divided by 200. All right, so now you have 1.5K instead of what you have over here, which is 2K. And this works out to 12.87 mils. So it's gone up, but it hasn't gone up as much. And if we then take that current, 12.87 volts across the 1K, subtract that from the 20 volts, we get 7.13 volts for VCE. So where are we, right? We've come up to, you know, if that's 20, that's 9.65, 12 is gonna be around here somewhere. And 7.13 volts there. So we have movement. But again, that's a 100% change in beta, we went from 100 to 200, right? If we figure out what the changes in IC work out to be, and the changes in VCE, and what are we looking at? Well, there's uh, a change of, of uh, going from 9.65 to 12.87. That's about 3.22 mils. And if we compare that to where we started, the 9.65, that turns out to be 33.4% of the change. And we see a similar thing with VCE. All right, we get 3.22 volt change, which compared to our starting point at 10.35 is a 31.1% change. Versus a 100% change, a doubling in the beta. So like I said, if, if we had a simple base bias, that Q point would have been way the heck up here. So it's definitely improved the stability of the circuit. Okay? All right, so another way of, of sort of attacking the problem. Here you go.